Hi everyone. Welcome to another installment of Cortex API tutorial videos. Today we will learn about the Cyclic Client API. The Cyclic Client is a low-level set of methods that allow you to communicate with your robot at the rate of 1 kHz. Before we jump into the example from our GitHub repository, let's first look at the documentation. So if we go on our GitHub page under the usual API CPP doc markdown summary pages, we can take a look at the basic click markdown. Here we learned that the basic click client only has four RPCs. The first one is refresh, which we'll call the refresh command and refresh feedback one after the other in a, in a single command. Then we have refresh command that allow you to send commands to the robot once per millisecond. And we get refresh feedback, which allows you to obtain the feedback from all the sensors on the robot every millisecond from the robot. Finally, we have access to refresh custom data, which allows you to read the custom data that is sent by the actuators. So what are in exactly inside commands and feedback? First, a command contains a frame ID. This tells you at which millisecond your command was sent and allows you to identify if you received the command twice in a row or if the robot skipped one command. Those commands contain actuator commands, which can contain commands for each actuator, as well as interconnect command, which can send commands to the, uh, to the tool or your end effector. Inside your actuator commands, you can actually send uh, either position, velocity, torque, or uh, current motor commands. And if you update this every millisecond, uh, the robot will move accordingly for each actuator. In the case of feedback, the complete robot feedback contains base feedback, actuator feedback for each actuator, and interconnect feedback. So the base feedback contains the general information of the robot, the actuator feedback contains the information for each joint, and finally the interconnect feedback will give you the information of your uh, tool interface. So for this example, let's just focus on the base feedback here. So as you can see, the base feedback, which contains the information from all the robot, contains a lot of interesting stuff. And this is data that's accessible every millisecond and is always updated by the robot. So when you fetch this, uh, this feedback, you can have access to the arm state, the voltage, the current, the tool pose, the twist and wrench of the robot, as well as the information regarding the state and the commands. So this is all really useful whenever you want to get feedback from your robot instead of using the high-level commands. These update as a, at a much faster rate. All right, so now we're ready. We know what commands and feedback are, so we're ready to move on to our example from the GitHub page. As you can see, as usual, I have combined the relevant content of the various example files into a single script that makes it more convenient for the video. If you want to follow at home, the content from this script actually come from the torque control cyclic file and the actuator low-level velocity control file. OK, so let's jump in and see how things are now different. The first major difference in our script is that we're now defining a port real-time to 10001. Usually, whenever we were connecting to the robot before, we were connecting the port 10,000. However, that port is not able to send commands to the robot at 1 kilohertz. So this will be necessary to be able to create a connection. Now, let's first skip all these block of code here. This is just defining a bunch of global variables that will be used for our examples later on. Let's move on to our main script. OK, so this is our main script. The first few lines we're already familiar with. This is the usual way we use to connect to the API. Then here, we're, connect we're making another connection, this time to the low-level API. So since the low-level API needs to speak to the robot at a much higher rate, the TCP client is not uh, able to do that. We will build a transport client UDP instead. 
So we're creating a new transport client UDP, and we're using it to create a router real time. So this router real time allows us to connect to the robot using our IP address and the real time port that we defined earlier to 10001. This block of code here we're already used to. This is the usual session info with the default admin, admin, username, and password. And we're creating a session with the regular API. Then we have to redo this with creating a real-time session manager that will allow us to connect to the router real-time and do exactly the same here. Finally, in terms of services, we can create the usual base client service. Then we have this new base cyclic client service that's connected to the router real time, connected to the port 10001. So this client is the client that contains the methods refresh, refresh feedback, and refresh command that we will be using. Additionally, we also have the actuator config client that we will use connected to the regular router to be able to tell the, ro the robot to switch the actuator to different control modes, such as position, velocity, or torque. OK, so now let's move on to our actual example. Our example starts with the usual example to move to the home position of the robot. Then we're initializing a few variables, including this new servoing mode uh, object. The servoing mode information will tell the robot what kind of control we intend to do, whether it's high level or low level. Now we're initializing a few timers. And the actual example begins here. So we're setting the servoing mode to low level servoing. This tells the robot that we will be sending commands to the robot at 1 kilohertz. So we're using set servoing mode to send this uh, object to the robot so that it's aware of the mode. And then we're already refreshing the feedback to initialize our feedback structure and all the values to the original values of the current state of our robot. So this function here fetches the information from all the sensors of a robot and puts it into our base feedback. Then we're getting our actuator counts using the regular base client. We're already used to this. And we initialize the commands that we will be sending to all the current values of the position of the actuators. So here, we're using the base feedback, getting each actuator and getting their position and putting in them in the command. So inside of our base command, then we can add a field for each actuator and set that position here. This is a Lambda function that we can use for asynchronous uh, feedback from the robot whenever we'll be using an asynchronous function call, when we'll be calling the refresh callback. Now here's our real-time loop. Our real-time loop simply is checking if our timer count, which counts millisecond, is smaller than the expected duration of our demonstration. So we're initializing a timer. And this is here is a basic way to validate that our loop was taking at least one millisecond. We don't want the loop to go faster than one kilohertz. Finally, we can go here. And uh, for each actuator, we can send a new command or update the actual command that's inside of our structure. For the sake of this example, let's only move the last actuator to prevent collisions with the environment around us. So if the index of our actuator is the last one, then we can increment the position command by one millisecond times the desired velocity of our robot, and then use that as the new position for our command. Then we can use refresh callback here, which will take the base command that we just built and send it to the robot to get the uh, to get the robot to move the way we want, and it will call lambda the lambda function callback here, which just prints a, a bunch of information that we will see later on, uh, and see the the state of the robot. In general, printing stuff like this takes a lot of time. It it will slow down your real time loop. This is just for the sake of the example, and you should not do this in your own code. Now, you might be asking, wasn't this supposed to be a velocity control example? Why are we controlling the position? 
The reason for this is actually quite simple. If you're trying to control the velocity and for a specific joint you want that velocity to be zero, then the internal controller of the robot will only send correction to the velocity of the robot if there's an error. This means that there's a delay between the moment when the robot starts moving, for example, due to gravity, and the time when the robot actually corrects that velocity. So the robot will always slow itself down, but it will never correct for the error in position that it accumulated before it started reacting. So since when we are actually sending a velocity to be zero, what we're actually expecting the robot to be is not moving at all, it's a lot more convenient to be using position control. Now let's move on to the rest of our example. We can see that we're already catching the errors the same way we did in previous example. And finally, to exit the example, we're returning the robot to single level servoing, which is what is used for high level control by setting the single level servoing and sending it to the base client. And that's it. Now let's move on to our torque control example. As you will see, the torque control example is really similar to the low level velocity control. So first, we're fetching the number of actuators from the base client. We're clearing faults if there are any. We're initializing a bunch of variables. And just like before, we're also setting the robot to the low-level servoing mode. This shouldn't be necessary uh, if we hadn't turned the mode back to single-level servoing at the end of the first example. So we start by setting it to low-level and initializing all the parameters in our base feedback to the current feedback of the robot using refresh feedback here. Then using that feedback, we can build our command to set the position of all the actuators, in, uh, the command position for all the actuators as their current position. This way the robot knows where it is whenever you're sending a command. We can send the first frame here using the refresh uh, function which takes a command uh, as an input and will output the feedback just like the refresh feedback function here except now we can also send the command at the same time. So this line here, uh, its goal is to just validate that all the inputs we put in there are valid. Now what we need to do is go into our actuator config client and set a control mode for one of our actuators to torque because what we want to do is torque control. So if since we want to send torque commands to our first actuators, what we need to do is take our actuator config, you set control mode and use our control mode message that we built right here and send it to our first actuator. This tells the actuator that whatever the input command we're sending, it should be interpreted as torque. Now, uh, this here is a measurement of the delta in position between the first and last actuators. The meaning of this line will make more sense once we're in the main body of the loop. We're initializing the last actuator torque as well as the first actuator torque to get the measurements. And we get an arbitrary torque amplification factor here that we'll use in the body of the example. OK, so this is our real-time loop here. Just like for the real-time velocity control, we are using a timer and we're using, uh, we're measuring the number of milliseconds and waiting for at least 1,000 to pass before creating a new loop. So the first thing we need to do here, as we did earlier, is to set the current position of the actuator we want to control as the positions uh, inside of our command. This prevents the robot from thinking there is a following error and triggering faults for no reason while you're trying to do your torque control. Then we can use the first actuator here and set its com commanded torque to the initial torque measured that was basically the zero of our robot, as well as a, our torque amplification factor times the torque feedback from our last actuator minus its uh, initial offset. So basically what this does is it takes the measure torque 
applied on our end effector and applies the same torque scaled by our torque amplification factor here to the first actuator of the robot. Also, just to complete the example here, we're adding this to whenever we're inputting torque on the uh, end effector actuator, then it will increment its position as well so that it's following and answering a little bit to your torque input. We're creating a frame ID and incrementing it at each loop. This way, the robot can know whenever you sent a different frame. If it skipped one, uh, you can also monitor whenever you're getting the last command, which one's the last that the robot executed. To avoid overflowing error, we're saturating it here at 65,535 and resetting it back to zero then. So this here sets the command ID to all of our actuator uh, commands. And we're simply using basic click refresh with our base command to send our commands to the robot. And that's it for the body of the example. The rest is just trying to catch different types of exceptions. The loop here increments the time. And once we complete our example, we set the control mode back to position catch a little more, uh, some more exceptions, and then finally setting back the example to low-level servoing. And that's it. Finally, I've built the example off screen, and now let's see what it looks like. So we're creating a session, the robot is moving to ohm. And now we're doing the velocity control. So for a few seconds, the robot last effector is moving at a constant velocity. As you can see, we're printing a lot of information. This is the callback from the refresh result. Now we're moving to the torque control. So as you can see, since there is no external torque applied on the first vector, the robot is not moving. But as soon as I'm applying some torque on the end vector, then the first actuator is moving as well, applying exactly the same torque. So this example is running for 15 seconds, and that's it. That's all for today's video. Next time we will do a hands-on session on low-level control, focusing more on the feedback part of the Cyclic Client. Given the early success of our initial video series, we will start deploying videos on a more regular basis, so don't forget to subscribe to our channel to make sure you don't miss any. Thank you for watching and see you next time.